Uh, okay, so hello everyone. So for this Python workshop, uh, um, I will speak about multi-agent reinforcement learning with Peiting Zoo. Uh, so Peiting Zoo, as you will see, is a Python library that is a bit uh, multi-agent equivalent of what Jim is. So we had a, a workshop uh, uh, on Jim too. Uh, so I will start by just so um, I hope that we will be able to code a bit together at the end. So hopefully it's going to be done only with uh, the Pitching Zoo library with a uh, so little coding that we have at the end. So if you want to code along, you can uh, install it. Um, and uh, so let's go. So first we'll start with some uh, reminders uh, about reinforcement learning. Um, so that's uh, so that's since on the graph, so you can really see that reinforcement learning uh, is when so you have an agent that interacts with an, an environment by so at every time step the agent takes an action, and uh, so the environment returns a reward signal as well as a new state for representing the state of the environment. Um, so this. Formalization is actually called the Markov decision process. I will not spend too much time on it, but uh, the idea is that um, so you will we will we can learn a policy which maximizes uh, the um, sum of the discontent rewards um, in order to solve a control task. So that's briefly it. I don't want to spend too much time on it. We already had uh, discussed it a little bit in the previous workshop. So simply uh, told, we want to learn a policy that maximizes um, this uh, e expression here. So that's expectation uh, of our uh, sum on discounted reward. And we have this discounted uh, value between zero and one. Um, OK, so, um, so what we, so if you know a bit about what was planning, you know that we have a library called Jim, which has, uh, we can say that Jim democratize AL for everybody. Um, so Jim was really uh, a, a toolkit that provided a standard API to, communi uh, to communicate between different reinforcement learning algorithms um, that's, um, that's developed by many different teams and a set of standard environments uh, for benchmark task. So it was developed and has been supported by OpenAI since 2016. Um, so it's open source. And so um, having this standard ABI has really helped uh, in, uh, in terms of benchmarking and um, uh, um, as we have boosting uh, the reinforcement learning research community. So, um, so yeah, so um, we, I mean, we, we did a workshop where we went to this a bit more in detail. So we had this, uh, uh, um, yeah, and I'm going to go on for the standard API, but we had a set of uh, natively supported an, an environment, but all of them um, were for single agent, right? Uh, uh, I don't know if that's for me. Oh no, sorry. Um, so the question is, what about if we have multiple agents? So for example, maybe you can uh, think about board games or many communication games, or a task of, of cooperative control where you want to uh, learn a, a policy that distributed uh, on, on civil agents. Uh, so this is not naturally supported uh, by the regime API. So that's the first um, issue that Petting Zoo uh, tries to address. Um, so um, quickly, so what do we mean when we think about multi-agent reinforcement learning? So one of the most general way you can think about it is as a partially observable stochastic game. So in, um, so I'm going to call it POAG. So in a POAG, you have a, an agent, you have a, a set of possible states, um, uh, for every agent, you have a set of possible actions, and then you have the transition function uh, that tells you the probability of going to one, from one state to another um, when you, you take so this uh, global action, which is like the product of all these uh, set of 
possible actions for all agents. And similarly, you have this reward function uh, for every agent. So uh, it's, yeah, yeah. it's in can this, you, yes? Can you just put your browser in full screen? Or? Oh, I'm sorry. Please something like uh, F11. F11 or something like that. Okay, sorry. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, so in this general framework where you have uh, this partially observable, so you do not assume that every agent can observe the global states. So you also have a set of possible observation for every agent, and this function, which is uh, stochastic, that tells you the probability of observing um, um, an observation uh, when you are in, in, in a given state. Uh, okay, so. That's the most, uh, well, that's the most general way to think about it. And pretty much um, most games um, can be formalized in, in this way. And so, um, so the idea of having Peking Zoo as a gene formality agent L is to provide a similarly standardized API with many supported environments that remains beginner friendly because that was also one of the big advantage of having Jim. Uh, that it was really intuitive and easy to use. Um, okay, so what do we have now? So obviously, Peking Zoo is not the first uh, library to come up with a, a support for multi-agent environments. So what we have now are um, so um, implementation that mostly draw on this uh, POSG formulation. So as an example that you uh, can uh, use with Airlib. Um, so obviously you have all the support for um, single agent environment with Jim. And when you switch to the multi-agent case, you have a very similar API where you simply have to give the set of, um, of all combined actions for all agents at every step um, and get uh, the set of all ob observation. So that situation that all agents play at, at the same time. Um, so that's obviously so that that works. So, but the the authors of petting zoo, so that's the paper here that um, in which I introduced petting zoo, um, so highlights a few problems or a few issues with this way of uh, implementing the super for multi agent environment. So obviously, many games are actually sequential. So you have several players, and every player takes a turn uh, to to play. So when you have a sequential games, and you have this simulation where every agent needs to um, act at the same time, that means you need you need to have dummy observation and action at every step. Um, also, uh, handling a varying number of agents uh, is is harder because you have this uh, um, fixed size of uh, well, well, we have this list of agents, and uh, if the, the, the list keeps changing and every time safe, it can get awkward. Um, also, that's something that's, um, that's so uh, unless you actually implement some kind of validation, um, agents are usually updated sequentially. That's something that I don't know how uh, known it is outside of a uh, multi agent community, but actually, very few. Um, Multi-agent uh, algorithm in reinforcement learning have uh, this parallel inference. Um, usually, uh, the agents are all updated sequentially in a in a for loop, and so the parallelization that you have, so you obviously have a um, uh, lot of implementation of parallelization um, structures where actually the, um, so you have a violation on the level of the environment. So you have the algorithm uh, learning and interacting with civil environments in parallel that increase like the, the, the size of well, the, uh, the number of samples that, that you get and that increase your performance. But on every single environment, the object is actually done sequentially for the agent. So that's, um, and so that's uh, one thing. And so what this means is that you often have these risk conditions where, well, the result can depend on the internal resolution of the order of your agent actions, which is not actually uh, captured by the peer agent model. What you 
conceptually, you assume that all Asian act at the same time, but internally, you actually have this uh, uh, internal order uh, for your agents. And so if you're not careful, uh, it can actually easily lead to work. So it's not like something that cannot happen because we're all very careful with our code and everything. But uh, um, the authors actually make a compelling case by going uh, and by going to look at actual code that was um, published by DeepMind on the on the cooperative multi-agent task, and they actually found that there were about some risk conditions that are simply that uh, that had evaded like uh, the 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 authors of the initial papers. Well, obviously, uh, if you have civil agents acting at the same time step, you might, they might, for example, have a collision or they, there might be a conflict in the interaction in the environment. And um, that, was a, that was not handled properly. And this uh, led to uh, wrong results. So the idea is that when you start implementing um, uh, your multi-agent problem, you will have a huge number of waste conditions and you just need to uh, mishandle one for, for it to, um, to cause issues with your uh, implementation. And uh, finally, uh, one last problem that you don't actually have a decomposition of the results. So when you are in a multi-agent environment, you're going to have rewards from different sources, uh, from the specificity on the, on the environment uh, itself, from the action of the other agents. And uh, well, when you have all the agents sleeping at the same time, you simply get like a sum of all these rewards um, at every step. And uh, so you might want or need to have a bit more granularity in the, the source and the origin of, of the reward, and that of debugging or to design a smarter algorithm. Yeah. Um, Okay, so uh, so is that clear? I don't know if there is in, any question. For me, it's clear. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, so so yeah, so the proposition uh, of the authors is to come up with some uh, to to think about this problem a bit differently with the agent environment cycle diagram. So the um, so the work of the formalization remains the same. Uh, we have so this uh, set of, of all agents, and we have this next agent function, uh, which um, at every step will give you like uh, will uh, return sorry uh, the agent that has to play next. So it's extremely simple and intuitive, but it's really just a conceptualize the game exactly how it is implemented uh, and uh, just so a small example. question so it could be also probabilistically right so the next agent uh, could be drawn with yes, some distribution exactly. okay thank yes, you exactly and so so for example so here so here for the change diagrams obviously it's um uh it's deterministic and you have uh, simply this this these two agents, and you have the, the idea of interacting with the environment at every step uh, for every agent sequentially. So that's really intuitative. So um, the advantage here, so we can simplify the game how it is really implemented. It's really simple. It's easier to handle birth or death of, of new agents, uh, which uh, was a, a problem with um, these varying sizes uh, on the PoAG approach. Um, so, uh, so how does it compare? So for example, this is just a reminder of the GMAPI method. Uh, that, so we have this step where uh, the, the agent takes a step in the environment, so it gives an action and ret um, returns so, uh, the, and the next observation, the reward associated to the state and action, and whether the, uh, the episode is done and some supplementary information. And then you have also classic um, method which is to reset to initialize environments and returns an initial observation and then to render just to visualize uh, so with the petting though it's a bit different so and the step in the environment for every agent um, so gets uh, well leads the action as well as a notificator for, for the agent and um, it uh, returns so it doesn't return anything. That's, it. That's because there is an added method called last, um, which allows every agent to observe the environment before acting. Uh, so when an, uh, when you call the estimator, so we'll just uh, show you the code just 
afterwards. Um, every agent uh, immediately guess what it would have had in the step method and gene, which is the observation reward done and supplementary information, uh, which allows any accumulated reward um, due to the action of other agents to be returned at that moment. And then the, you also have this agent ether um, function, which is kind of an iterator. So that's an actual class of a Python iterator, um, but that returns a next agent um, uh, for every time. Claire? Uh, yes? Uh, just a question. So here, the um, observing the environment is, um, I mean, it's uh, an observation that could be made by any agent or uh, I, I meant I, I was the, under the impression that in the partially observable uh, stochastic games, you might mm -hmm. want agents to have different points of view on the. Yes, yes. Yes. So, as if the, the thing is that the, so maybe show it, but the, the, well, the environment maintains uh, an agent, a sort of agent pointer. And so when you call the last method, ah, okay. you you get the information information for the uh, in by the, by the pointed term. agent. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So yes. Yeah, so this lay that has some disadvantage. So it's a bit more verbose. It's a more more line of of, of codes compared to the PoEG approach. You also have obviously more calls to the API because you do one call for agent. Um, so usually that is that it's not um, uh, it's not necessarily problematic unless you have games with a huge number of agents to start having some performance issues. Uh, you don't have any inference in parallel. So as I said, it's rarely done right now in the in the communities. There are actually very few implementation with a parallel inference, but it's definite. But it's uh, definitely one area of, of improvement that cannot be done with this uh, with this approach. Uh, that being said, so putting Zoo also handed PoEG like API, so it has both the AC and the PoEG like API. From what I've seen from the code, uh, the PoEG like API seems to be mostly a wrapper around the AC. So I um, don't think it will actually solve any performance issues. Um, it's mostly useful uh, if you want to have integration with uh, algorithm that expects a PoEG like API. So, right. Uh, so just like Jim, um, Pitting the comes with a set of support and environments. I'm going to show you which we have here. Um, okay, so there is uh, some classic HRV environments um, as for any kind of multiplayer games. Uh, where well, you actually get as observation just the image um, uh, of the game. You have some cooperative games, uh, for example, the, the piston ball, um, where like all the pistons have to coordinate to advance the ball. Uh, what we're going to look at today mostly are the set of environment called multi-particle environments. Um, well, so you just have a different particles um, so that they have interacts either in a cooperative or in a competitive way. So you have, for example, the predator prey um, a type of, of task. And you also have um, uh, the simple speaker listener that I will introduce la later. Uh, so yes, you have a, it's pretty varied. Um, so, well, how do I? Okay, so where was I? Okay, so multi-particle environments. So that's a set of communication uh, oriented environments. A particle can move, communicate, see each other, uh, push each other around, etc. cetera. Um, so for example, in the simple speaker listener, you only have two agents, one speaker and one listener. So the speaker, so the, the idea is that you have three landmarks that are uh, shown here with a different color. Um, so the speaker uh, has an ID of what is the goal landmark. So it's uh, what you call the goal ID, which in fact is just the color of the target. And um, it has a, a communication, um, um, sorry, um, 
so let's uh, speak of observation phase and the listener uh, doesn't uh, observe the um, the idea of the goal, uh, it has observed its own velocity, uh, the, the position of all the landmarks, and a communication channel between the speaker and the listener. And uh, so, uh, while well, the speaker can uh, needs to learn to um, translate the goal ID uh, into uh, um, a um, representation of one of the landmark and the listener and the listener uh, well needs to navigate toward the goal landmark. Uh, okay, so so how does it uh, work? So you can simply so I import here the environment from Peking Zoo. Uh, so MP that's the set of this. Uh, um, the name of uh, this family, sorry. And then, so I create my environment. So here I just have the mic cycle, but simply uh, the number of uh, steps before the episode is done. Uh, I can choose continuous section or not, and that's just uh, a random mode. So here, when I, when I will uh, call the random method, I will have a NumPy array. Okay, so I always start by representing my environment. So you see that here compared to the gym API, I do not actually have anything. Uh, I, well, the method does not actually output anything. So it's uh, similar to the step method. And I can look at my agent here. So I have one speaker and one listener with uh, two different IDs. So every, uh, so each agent has its own observation space here. And so you see here that uh, observation space here is, is a method. Uh, it, it's a method, it's not a, uh, yes? Oh, sorry, I thought. Okay, so it, it, it's a method. So it's not um, a property like uh, in the standard gym API because you, you pass the ID uh, of the agent to, to the method. And so it, you see that the, the speaker uh, has this, um, uh, this goal ID observation that has this, that is of dimension three, and the listener uh, have this uh, large observation space. And well, similarly here, so it's just discrete action space. So here, um, the speaker should learn in in AAA simply to uh, say one, uh, zero, one, or two, and the listener can uh, either stay still or move up, down, left, right. So uh, the five different discrete actions. Um, okay, so this is the last method. So as you see here, I get uh, this uh, goal ID. So I am clearly looking at the observation of the speaker. And so here, the ID is that we have the agent selection, which uh, acts like a pointer here, where I can select the agents um, that, uh, that is currently playing. And if I do again the last, I will now see that I have this observation which corresponds to the listener's observation. So obviously, when you actually implement it, this uh, agent selection uh, is handled internally by the environment. Um, and so, uh, well, here, so we have this agent eta method. Um, so as I said, the, the change uh, in agent selection is handled by the environment when you design it. Uh, so it, it happens in the step method. So here, if I simply do a simple um, a simple loop, uh, well, I have the agent in the agent iter. You'll see that I will switch from speaker to listener, speaker to listener, which is handled here in the in step method. And the other thing which is handled is obviously the termination. Uh, so in our case, it's probably truncated uh, after the 25 mic cycles uh, uh, that we have configured uh, earlier. Um, right. So um, just to move this. And so uh, yes, okay. So I will just show you a bit how this how to interact with this environment. So for now, I, I will focus today more on the environment de design part. Uh, I will, uh, we, have, we have a small part also on the um, on how to quickly learn policies. Uh, but for now, I simply design a hand-coded uh, policy where we I imagine an all-knowable speaker that uh, can observe the world. 
and uh, can, that can simply output the correct uh, ID um, for every for every observed landmark, and uh, that just uh, outputs this ID uh, in the in one of the vector. And uh, well, similarly, I have uh, this learning policy, so it's just a function, but I keep the standard um, policy class and predict methods uh, structure. And uh, well, similarly, the, the listener policy knows exactly um, what to look at and simply navigate uh, throughout the landmark. So that's simple. So we can just look at what's going on. Um, Okay, so um, I think I have nothing anymore. Okay, so that's, that's what I wanted to do. Okay, so um, I did not, uh, I did not see anything. Okay, sorry, I had to remove it because it was a bit too. Okay, so this is the the full loop. So I simply uh, ask, uh, I simply call the respective policy, and uh, so I can hear every agent um, had gets its own reward. So in this case, it's a cooperative task that is actually the exact same reward to both agents. Um, I handle the termination here uh, simply by sending a known action. If, you, if if I had sent something other than a known action for a terminated agent. Uh, it would have for an error. So every time, um, so as, uh, as we've seen, it's possible to terminate uh, agents at different, well, different agents at different points in the environment. It's also possible to create an agent. Um, so the termination is handled separately. And you see this uh, as when the, um, okay, so I'm sorry. Okay, so when all it, when an agent is done, it's removed from the set of agents available in the environment. So here, all agents are done. So this is um, well, this is an empty list. Um, okay, so I think that's um, that's it for the the basic of how this works. Um, there's another environment that uh, might be interesting for. Rest, which is a simple spread. So it's also a cooperative task, task uh, where you have so three particles and uh, each of them needs to, um, and well, they need to spread it, uh, each other on the three available landmarks. Um, so all, so they have symmetric observation. They also see their on the velocity, their, their position, the position of the landmark and position of, of the agents. And what well, these are, uh, communication channel here that's uh, just um, um, just I think a leftover from the uh, environment design because it's using data environment. Um, so that's again similar action. Um, I will just show you how it works. Okay, so I oh, know, sorry. Uh, I think, okay, we have this. So now we have received the all three agents. And so we, here we have exactly that the same observation pace for all agents. And similarly, uh, we have the same action. Oh, I keep it continuous. Okay. So, um, okay, so I will just uh, do a little part of what we could do to have the same. A, a simple learning routine. Um, so we, we had done a, a workshop where we had used the stable baseline, uh, which is um, a library uh, with, uh, well, uh, baseline of implemented the uh, standard reinforcement learning algorithm uh, that are easy to, uh, easy to, to train and, uh, and evaluate. So it's also possible to use them on um, a multi-agent uh, case, but it's um, well, it's not made for that. So what you can do is do something called shared parameter learning. So on some environments, you can assume that maybe you could learn a, same, uh, a single policy for all agents. That's obviously uh, that obviously doesn't work for all type of environments. 
um, uh, typically for the PKL incident, that would not make any sense. And there are some environments that we can try to do this. Um, so I'm going to show you how it's done. Um, and that it has a petting zoo for some environments. Uh, but I think, yeah, I think you need to be careful about the type of uh, um, environment that you can choose for, for this approach. Um, so, so, so stable baseline free, so it's just a set of uh, reliable and tested implementation on, on PyTorch, we didn't mention it. Uh, and so the idea is to facilitate result for replication, which is also a huge issue in, in reinforcement learning, especially deep reinforcement learning. And uh, so it's done uh, to work on a gym interface. So I show you how you can uh, use um, uh, pitching the environment uh, with a learned stable based on policy. So um, the people, uh, well, the people behind pitching the also have created a, a library called Super Suite, uh, which is a, a collection of, of, of wrappers. Um, so uh, wrappers. Um, Yes, for all the different environments, when you have a wrapper, it's you just uh, create another environment which you have added function, uh, added method. Uh, so it's done especially for observation and reward preprocessing, and um, it's easy to integrate into standard ML algorithm like stable baseline. So I'm going to show you quickly how it's done before we go to the coding parts fully. Um, Yes, so uh, here you have uh, the parallel environment. So it's a bit different, I don't know if you remember, when we uh, um, instantiated our environment earlier, we only had ANF. Here we have the parallel environment, that means that we are going to call uh, the POAG-like implementation um, of the environment, uh, which, uh, well, can be then used uh, to, uh, to integrate it with uh, standard the standard benchmark. So when I do this reset, I actually get a dictionary. So once you have this, you uh, you actually, I think you can, um, well, as a, um, oh, sorry, uh, in the set of uh, observation and action space available in GIM, you also have a special dict space. So you might also find uh, some um, benchmark, um, some baseline implementation of reinforcement learning method on which you can directly use this environment with a, this dictionary-like um, structure. So um, that's, so here you have the same thing here for the action space. Uh, so here again, it's completely cooperative. It's similar for everyone. So could we learn the same policy for all agents? So maybe we could try to do it for public test if shell observation goal for all agents. Um, so here I, I, I lied a little bit because you can only use super suite to uh, convert your environment into an environment that you can use um, for a, a typical stable baseline um, benchmark. But, uh, so actually, there is a bit of problem right now between the version. I, I think they will fix it soon, but between the different version of regime used uh, by stable baseline and um, uh, and uh, and pitching though. So just for the so Jim uh, is now uh, has been all of the people who maintain Jim have decided to uh, maintain on, on, on a new fork called Gymnasium. So I probably Gymnasium will be the new Gym. So to fix this, I use just uh, this Markov vector. Oh, I, it's the same uh, wrappers used by SuperSuite. I just fix it a little bit to handle the, the discrepancies. But hopefully this will be fixed soon. And uh, so now you see I have a typical observation uh, NumPy array exactly like I would have in Jim. So I have the three different agents here and just the observation for every agent on the y axis. So um, this has a proper synonym of three. So what's happening here uh, is that, so as I've said, uh, standard uh, RL uh, implementation do not parallelize increments. They do have this. Um, acting about this uh, duplication in our environments and with the agent acting in parallel in all these environments. So the little trick used here is that we pretend that we have three environments, uh, even though we obviously have one environment with three agents. And um, when the 
the model acts in three different, well, I'd put three different uh, uh, actions with obviously the same policy because we have this, this parameter sharing paradigm. Um, the wrapper that I've introduced earlier will uh, retrieve the three different actions and make them act in a single environment. So that's a little trick used here for this parameter sharing. And once you've done this, well, we can simply use um, uh, any model. So here I use uh, an actor critique um, approach. Uh, so it's a model called DDPG. And uh, so we don't go too much into the data, but uh, it's, uh, it's a neural network policy. Uh, OK, so what can I get with this? So I load my model. I have. Um, just my little policy function returning um, the uh, the action output by the policy. So what does it give to me? So it's I show you fully. So it's not terrible, I think. Um, oh, that's the difference between what I had earlier. So it's honestly. Bad. So this is um, the output for a training uh, only on 1,000 episodes. So obviously, I would need to train it a lot more. Uh, I would also, uh, it's also, I haven't done any kind of tuning in, uh, in any kind of tuning on the parameters. Um, so this is, uh, yeah. So that's why I'm not. I, I'm, I don't know if I'm. I'm not fully really convinced by this approach, but for for the record, it's actually been used successfully. I think on one environment at least. Uh, with IG of parameter sharing. So the so it's possible to train it. So they definitely have all the uh, uh, all the uh, architectures to, to do it. The conversion of environments, uh, uh, sorry, with the uh, proper environment wrappers. Uh, but depending on the on environment, the result can be a bit uh, when, on this one, I mean, I can't really conclude about all the type of environments, but for what I've tried, it's not fully, I'm not fully really convinced. So yeah, but I still wanted to show you that because I think it can, might be interesting. And also uh, the people of Fitting Zoo of Manage apparently to train uh, with this approach uh, on some environments. Uh, so I haven't been able to reproduce it. Uh, but yes, I think it's uh, interesting nonetheless. And uh, okay, so now we hopefully can get to the coding path. I don't know if people want to code with, uh, if we can code together. How well I, I don't know, well, we try to do it. <laughs> what? Yeah, you, you're very ambitious. Uh. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so we're not code together. Mm. Okay, so well, uh, so I was just wondering. Considering the fact that we, we have only one quarter an hour left. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so I'll just uh, show you what I was thinking about. So yeah, so how to like design this custom environment. And so I thought about doing a, a famous riddle that could be interesting. So it's famous for that, but you have 100 mm. prisoners who have been the newly entered into prison. So what and tell them that starting tomorrow, each of them will be placed in an isolated cell and able to communicate mm. with each other. And so each day the warden will choose one of the prisoners and he found at random. Um, with the placement, sorry, that is the bit of the letters missing, and placing in a central integration room containing only a light bulb with a circle switch. And so the prisoner will be able to observe the current state of the light bulb, and he can, if he wishes, he can toggle off the light bulb. And uh, he can, he has the option of announcing that he believes that all prisoners have visited the, inter the interrogation room. And if he's right, then all the prisoners are free, but if he's wrong, they are not. So it's a famous riddle. So I thought it would be interesting to try to think about how we could implement it in, in petting zoo. Uh, so uh, I started by uh, a list of actions. So off, on, uh, tell, or known. So obviously I could have only one action here that would be switch, um, which will uh, obviously um, have a different uh, um, uh, Consequence, sorry, depending on the initial state. Uh, I don't, I, I don't fully really know what is uh, what would be the impact of sending it for learning because I've done uh, the learning approach uh, for this environment. Uh, I think intuitively, I don't know if I'm that's true, but intuitively, I think 
maybe uh, this uh, having a single switch action would uh, make the, the, the dynamics a bit more complex to learn. I'm not really sure about that. But um, so I've decided just to, to have this uh, off on, where obviously if it's already off, it stays off, if it's already on, it stays on. And well, the state is uh, really easy, it's either off or on, and it's a global state of cell that everyone. Okay, so the first step is to have uh, this metadata. So uh, it's just a, to, just a random mode, just uh, how you're going to uh, re represent the uh, the environment, and that's just a name that you can choose. So that's really just a, um, uh, yeah. So then you ha have to decide. I'm not going to put it, but you choose uh, the set of possible agents. So it's called possible agents because, as I said, but you can uh, add or um, remove agent during the game. So it's not the case in this game, particularly. So I just um, well, use uh, any set of ID for the number of, of agents. And uh, I initialize the global state at zero, so the light bulb is off, and then I have a max situation after which a game is off. Uh, okay, so we have to choose the right action space. So in our case, I think it's pretty straightforward. We have to use discrete action space um, with the number of actions. And uh, similarly, discrete action space, uh, with either a zero or on, the way it's on or off. So, um, so here, because we have this AC approach, we really model the the game sequentially. We don't actually have to have an um, a state representing whether an agent is or not in the inter interrogation room, which uh, uh, can be ne which is necessary for other implementations. Uh, because whenever an agent is required to ask, he's already in the inter interrogation room. So we only have this probable state to observe. And uh, so here, uh, yes, so obviously, the, well, so as I've said, the observation action phase here method, which uh, gets, uh, which takes um, an, an agent AD and returns uh, so the observation of action phase retrieved from the global dictionary that I've introduced earlier. And then, um, so this is the observe uh, function for that if agent calls when it uh, it has it it, uh, it calls it plus method, where it just uh, observe the global states. Okay, uh, so that's the reset. So in reset, I simply um, initialize all the dictionary that I will need to to maintain. And I'm sorry, I'm just going to. And um, I also initialize my agent selector. So I choose randomly uh, in my set of agents. And so the agent selection, so I just um, uh, have the IP is, is thought is actually the ID of the agent. So I just switch on the ID of the agent here. And I look at all the agent that I visited the, inter the interrogation room uh, here. So, um, when I do the step, so uh, so when uh, an agent uh, takes a step in the environment, so I add it in the list of the agents. So it's very simple, it's just a, the simplest way to to do it. And then I simply um, I simply switch in on on off. Uh, if that's if the agent has selected one of two two option. Or uh, if the agent tell, I simply check if uh, he's right. Uh, if uh, all the uh, agent that have, uh, if all the agent have visited here, and I return one or minus one, and then it's over. So the game really ends uh, as soon as an agent tries to tell. Uh, okay, and then so I just have other data number of uh, of my moves. Uh, I allow for truncation uh, because. Obviously, the game is uh, going forever, and um, I'm pretty much done here. I just need to prepare the next selection. So yes, that's what we were speaking about earlier. We can absolutely have a, a, a random uh, selection of the next agent, and then again, that's exactly what what we need. So we have again this uh, random here um, uh, choice, and. Uh, when I'm done, so that is this. Uh, so for the render, I did some do something extremely simple. I just print. Uh, I don't know. I just print. Um, 
the well the the agent that is currently in the interrogation room in the state of the light bulb not doing any kind of uh, image uh okay so i have i have coded this environment in my uh in my in my python uh files so it's my custom auth i have a simple uh, counter policy so obviously the famous um most intuitive policy where you have one agent acting as a counter and um well that turns the, the light off and other agent that only turn the light on uh, if you have never been in the room so that's a, a simpler way to count the number of people that have visited the um, the interrogation room and uh, then i i tried with simply 10 agents and so uh, here i can uh, survive my optimal policy that i have designed and i'm okay oh so i just have to and so obviously so depending uh well with the circuitry of the next agent function uh, i can have different um uh number of steps to get it done and so you see every time i any of uh, my agent tells it always gets to reward one because that's the optimal policy so that's uh, how to go this up simple uh, it's a really simple uh, example we don't have a date of agents uh, but i think it's always interesting because we we have this um uh, this random selection of the next agent we also don't have to indicate actually uh, um, uh, a bit for the um, uh, for the present substance of the agent in the inter interrogation room because they with, with this sequential approach uh, agents only act when they are in the in interrogation room um okay so okay uh so okay so well that's actually it uh, yeah, so uh, i was hoping to like that by reducing a bit the size we would be able to cut together but i think i need to give up on this altogether and uh so if you have any question uh, please uh go go find okay so oh. i think that you can uh thank uh, thank claire a lot Uh, who wants to start with questions? So, so I, I have one clear. So um, what's about the, let's say, performances of uh, of the, the, the state of the art uh, multi-agent uh, RL algorithms these days? Does it really work or? I mean, uh, does what really works? So yeah, I didn't uh, so, get to info. So, um, so mostly, uh, um, if I understand correctly, Petting Zoo uh, provides um, uh, a framework for um, multi-agent uh, RL environments. Um, yes. Does it also provide um, learning algorithms or? Oh no 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 it does not. Okay. No, it's it's really about the designing of uh, of of environments. Uh, then to be used uh, for benchmarking policies, learn with other, um, with any algorithm. Uh, the I've been seeing those what we've tried on the on the environment. They have tried to learn this uh, shared uh, this shared parameter policy that I've shown. Um, with uh, so that can be in principle combined with any any algorithm as well as any implementation of it uh, with this uh, parallel environment wrapper, but they do not uh, design any algorithm. Okay, and I have another broader question, which which is uh, so. Uh, last time I checked, uh, I, I'm, I felt that uh, multi-agent re reinforcement learning didn't work so well, and it was and there there were a lot of issues uh, with with uh, specific to multi-agent learning. And how is the state of affairs uh, these days uh, with respect to that question? The, the, yeah, the, the so... multi-agent RL. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah so as well so it, 
had some breakthrough in some for some specific, mostly game application in terms of uh, board games and video games. Um, uh, thinking about uh, things like uh, well, Go, uh, StarCraft, this kind of application, mostly by DeepMind. Um, mostly uh, for real uh, industrial ap application, we're not here yet. Uh, for things that, are, that can actually be deployed uh, for initial settings, we're not here yet. Um, and uh, a lot of it uh, also is a problem of um, reliability and reproducibility. Uh, well, deep reinforcement learning without a multi agent path uh, already has a well, lot of variance in the performance, uh, a lot of uh, well, wide differences between different implementation of the same algorithm and the same environment. And um, well, uh, mutation with reinforcement learning, well, obviously, uh, uh, has similar issues with also this uh, stationarity added with uh, multiple agents acting together. So there are different ways to handle this, but that's definitely an added challenge. And um, I would say that it's breakthrough for mostly toy application and specific board games, but still, and even then, it's also combined with a lot of uh, standard planning. And um, for uh, industry well, scalable or, well, or just deployable uh, in, in, in the industry uh, algorithm, we're not here yet, to be honest. I don't know if that's the uh, answer to the question. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Are there other questions? Okay, so I think we can thank Claire again. Thank you very much. Have a good lunch, everybody. Sorry again.